Ever since I have seen this movie as a child, I was always fond of how slightly different this movie was from the other animated Disney films at the time, as it was darker than the other Disney films, and it dealt with heavy themes like prejudice that might sail over most kids' heads. What I really enjoyed about this film was the fact that how it handled tough issues like prejudice while presenting it in a way that would be appealing to kids. This film greatly explains to the audience about the ugliness of prejudice, as both Quasimo and Esmeralda are victims of the prejudice shown in the society. Larry see how the Maitlands tried to scare off the Deets family. One of my all-time favorite scenes was where the Maitlands tried to scare off the Deets family during the Banana Boat song scene where the Maitlands possessed the Deets family to dance to the Banana Boat song. I also love the Maitland's relationship with Lydia Dietz, the daughter of Charles and Delia Dietz, as they treated Lydia like their own daughter, even going as far as to explain about what death is like for them and what Lydia should know about death. Monkey Bones rated PG-13 for crude humor some nudity, which is an appropriate rating for this movie. There are some far humor many sexual jokes made throughout this film, so some adults might find this movie a bit too immature, why young children would not be able to watch this movie because of the PG-13 rating and because of some frightening images, which are mainly shown during the scenes where Stu goes into downtown. The best part about this movie was James Horner's music, and ever since I had first watched this movie, I was just mesmerized by the beautiful soundtrack by James Horner. The soundtrack has a slight ghostly feel to it, as there is a choir that accompanies the music, and it really brings a very beautiful vibe to the movie. I was... The film starts off with Mrs. Parts telling everyone the story about the Christmas they had last year together, and how the Beast hated Christmas because of the fact that that was the day that he was transformed into a Beast. It's a hundred years into the future, and Manhattan has become a dystopian city filled with crime. Living in this dreary futuristic world is a young girl named Malika Frey, who works as a thief for hire, stealing precious artifacts for her boss Gunther. One day, a demon named Orkhan suddenly comes out of the blue and starts telling Malika that she comes from a long line of vampire slayers, and that it is her destiny to slay vampires. A common boat that mainly focuses on the relationship between a hero and the villain, rather than focusing on their big fight with each other, and because of that concept rarely being used to its full extent, Batman the Killing Joke was definitely the comment that really defined that concept in a brilliant and intense way. Alamore had done a brilliant job at writing this story, and even though this comic is only about 46 pages long, which is pretty short for a comic book that has a major arc, there were many life-changing situations in the story that really changed the lives of the Batman characters to huge levels. about two baby brothers named Norbert and Dagon, who were forced to move out of their parents' dam after their youngest sister, Stacey and Chelsea, were born. The show after that event basically details Norbert and Dagon's war on crazy adventures while they were living on their own. About how an alien invader named Zim, who is a part of the great alien race called the Urken race, hears about how the almighty tallest, two aliens who were made leaders of the Urken race because they were the tallest aliens, are planning to send their best Urken soldiers to become invaders of the planets they are assigned for, which the plan is called Operation Impending Doom Number 2. Another character that was sort of treated poorly in this series was Storm, as she seems more like a background character who does nothing but shoot lightning bolts whenever she is needed. I wanted to see the strong and independent character show in the comics, as she was once the leader of the X-Men and served as second-in-command in the X-Men. It would have been interesting to see Storm actually assist Wolverine in his duties as the leader of the X-Men, so that way she would have served a purpose really in the, the show. segments where LeVar Burton travels to different places in each episode and explains to the audience about how each person does their jobs, or about the history of certain places, like in the episode Mama Do Allow, when LeVar Burton interviews an alligator trainer about the nature of alligators, as she is the most interesting character I've ever seen in this show. Toph was so interesting to me because even though she was blind, she never let that get in the way of her earthbending skills, which were truly amazing to look at. I also love Toph's rough personality as it usually clashes with Katara's soft nature, but the two of them were still best friends regardless of their different personalities. Now the comics are being sent in alternate universes. If the comics go through a reboot or set in an alternate universe like Ultimate X-Men, Ultimate Spider-Man, and Ultimate Avengers, then the slate is clean, and writers could do whatever they want to do with the characters since they wouldn't have to worry about reading older stories of the comics they want to write about in order to stay consistent with the characters in the events. Now, there is an upcoming event called Avengers vs. X-Men that's coming out in April of this year, and the problem with that is that there wasn't any real closure with schism yet, since we don't know if the X-Men are going to permanently separate from each other, or that this, this event will reunite them again. I think that Marvel put out the Avengers vs. X-Men event a bit too quickly, because both Uncanny X-Men and Wolverine and the X-Men haven't even reached the 10th issue of their series yet, and there's already another event coming up for both series, 
and I felt that we weren't really exposed enough to the new team setup of the X-Men teams yet to get used to their methods of fighting threats. That really affected the comic book universe was the death of Superman and the death of Colossus from X Men. The death of Superman was a huge deal because when Superman was killed by Doomsday, it pretty much told the fans that even the Man of Steel couldn't avoid the clutches of death. In the Legacy Virus arc of X Men, X Men member Colossus died during this arc by sacrificing his own life to protect the mutant race from a deadly virus, and this death was extremely memorable because Colossus died for a very good cause. In my opinion, character. I think Crap, that an interesting character. story around that character. Having a storyline where the overpowered character defeats the foe and then goes home is not an interesting way to create craft the character. Just like any other character, there should be some degree. I will also tend to forget about the bad moments of my favorite characters if another writer comes by and makes the character better again. An example of my favorite character being written a tad poorly is Colossus from X. Storm is another character I want to have her own solo series, because not only will we have another solo series with a female lead character, since X-23 series was canceled, and I haven't read Captain Marvel yet, but we will be able to see Storm as the strong, independent character she was presented as before. So, do you think that solo series helped comic book characters become a part? Second is the relaunch of Uncanny X-Force, which is going to be written by Sam Humphreys, with artwork by Ron Garney. And in this lineup, we have Psylocke, Storm, Puck, and Spyro. I'm actually a bit excited for this title, just because Storm is going to be in this title. And it would be interesting to see why she's on the team when she was against X-Force in the first place. It would be interesting to see where the story goes and see if it can maintain the popularity that the original Uncanny X-Force had. Characters who came from different countries and cultures, such as Colossus coming from Russia, Storm coming from Africa, and Wolverine coming from Canada. And because these characters came from different backgrounds, we were able to see the stories told from their point of view, and whether or not the situations at hand clashes with their cultures and their beliefs. Also, I think that the stories are often more interesting whenever there are different characters involved, because there would be so many stories to tell with each different character, and because there are so many characters in the X-Men universe, the possibilities are endless, and you can always find a new character to tell a different story to the audience. I guess if there was an issue about having too many characters in one comic book series, is that sometimes most, writers, especially during the years where only Emma Frost, Cyclops, and Wolverine got all the attention, and the other X-Men characters were thrown to the background. So, which types of books do you like to read more? Do you like to read solo books more or team books more? Feel free to comment your. I also love playing Rogue Galaxy, which was a game that's similar to Final Fantasy. I think it came out in 2007, if I'm not um, mistaken. And um, it stars uh, Jax. I think Jaxer, um, and he's voiced by Will Fidel, and I really enjoy playing that game. The storyline's great. Um, also, another role-playing game where I could play his character. It was just something I really enjoyed. And then, later, Nickelodeon aired one of his most inspirational shows called You Can't Do That on Television, which was a Canadian sketch comedy show that introduced the famous green slime that was featured on Nickelodeon's later shows, like Double Dare and Figure It Out. In 1985, Nickelodeon created a new nighttime blog called Nick at Night, which usually aired older shows such as I Love Lucy and The Brady Bunch. If you are a new comic book reader and you wanted to get into Batman, the Batman Year One is the perfect place to start, even though Batman existed way before the 1980s. Frank Miller had done an excellent job of retelling Batman's origin story without really changing most of his origin story. I also love the way that Frank Miller went into detail about Batman's first year when and all the struggles he had, especially with the public viewing him as the bad guy the first time around. I also love the side story with James Gordon. In the second volume of The Doll's House, there are many stories going on in this volume, which includes Dream still trying to restore everything that happened in his kingdom after he was kidnapped in the first volume by trying to find his missing subjects, which include Corinthium, Brute and Glob, and Fiddler's Green. Meanwhile, in another part of the story, a young woman named Rose Walker sets out to find a missing brother, Jed, after she discovers that her grandmother's still alive. I admit that this story was truly shocking, disturbing, and memorable to me because of the fact that you wouldn't think that you would see all this disturbing content in a Batman comic. Alan Moore did a brilliant job of pushing the envelope for the usual Batman story, but providing some of the most disturbing scenes to ever appear in comics, the shooting of Barbara Gordon and her being tortured afterwards. I also really enjoyed the backstory in the This episode was hilarious and dramatic in that typical angry beaver style that really made me enjoy this episode so much. The scenes where Norbert starts sleepwalking is done in a very creative fashion. 
especially a scene when Norman pretends he is a Viking woman, and he is dressed in a little mini and wears this place on his chest while chasing Daggett around with a small axe. I also love the scenes when Norbert starts eating loads of junk food while watching horror movies, because I'm a sucker for shows that have episodes where the characters eat a lot of food, and Norbert certainly eats a lot of junk food in this episode. In the flying ship. In this ancient Russian hotel, when the Tsar of Russia sends a proclamation throughout the land that whoever builds him a flying ship will win the hand of his lovely daughter, the princess, a peasant boy who is known as the fool decides to go on a journey to build such a ship. However, after the fool finally gets the ship ready, with a little help from a strange old man, he ends up meeting several strange men who all end up having strange superhuman abilities that eventually helps the fool when the Tsar refuses to give his daughter's hand in marriage to a peasant and starts coming with several tough challenges for the fool to complete before he marries his daughter. It's so obvious that the fool and the flying ships might absolutely be friend me since I'm looking for new friends to talk to. And if there's a comic book discussion video you want me to discuss, feel free to either respond on the Big Kids Big News website or on YouTube. The link to my profile page is on the website, is in both this video and in the description box below, so feel free to check it out. Well, that's it for the news update I have. This is Ravnius Blog, and I'll see you later.